Grace unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dr. James Dobson, a Christian psychologist, wrote some time ago in one of his books on raising children this scenario. He said, you know, you just finished washing your patio windows and your patio door, and you've explained very clearly to your child or children that you've got company coming this afternoon, and at least until the company was gone, no finger marks on the windows. And after you've explained that very clearly to your young child or children, he said, your child responds by going, He said, at that point, you better very clearly and definitely establish who's in charge. Because that's what your child is asking. Who's in charge around here, you or me? His point was, if you don't establish who's in charge when your child is four, five, or six, how are you ever going to do it when they're 14, 15, and 16? When the Isra children of Israel were traveling through the wilderness, they were very appropriately called then and throughout the Old Testament the children of Israel because they were descendants of Israel. But in many ways, there's a whole other way that we could understand them as the children of Israel. Because they so frequently acted like children, spiritually weak, spiritually immature, and there are any number of events that occurred because they acted like spiritual children, grossly immature and rebellious. We've got one of those examples in our text for today from that Old Testament reading in Numbers. And in it we can see the children of Israel clutching their little fist and raising their puny fist to God and saying, Who's in charge? You or us? That's written as a warning because Satan can so easily lead any of us into clenching our little fist, raising it to God and asking, who's in charge? Because truth be told, we want to be in charge at that point in time. So we look at this Old Testament text from that perspective. Let me give you a little bit of historical background for what's all happening because this isn't exactly one of the most familiar accounts of the Old Testament. The children of Israel had been in Egypt. God had there blessed them so that they had become a large nation. But during the latter period of their time there, they were forced into slavery. And it was really a very brutal slavery that they were forced under. In time, God had kept his promise and his word and came to them and said he's going to be leading them out of Egypt to the promised land. In order for that to happen, God had to perform ten very powerful and destructive plagues on Egypt. And it wasn't until that tenth plague that the leadership of Egypt said, okay, we will release you from slavery, you are free to go. And the Israelites had marched out of Egypt. They had come to the Red Sea. God split the waters and they were able to walk through that deep body of water. Meanwhile, the Egyptians had changed their minds. They wanted that free labor back again. And so they pursued with their army. The Israelites were just exiting the sea on the opposite end. And the Egyptians entered that sea into that valley of water. God caused that valley once the Israelites were out to come crashing down and destroy the entire army. Another powerful demonstration of what God can do to keep his word. And then they journeyed out a harsh wilderness. Two million people. Grasp that number, first of all. That's three times the population of the city of Milwaukee. That many people walked out into a desolate wilderness 
and God fed them and watered them and their flocks and herds miraculously. And they came to Mount Sinai and God revealed his glory as he told them his word and his commands. And from there they journeyed up to the promised land. They sent 12 spies into that land that God had promised them. The spies came back and they were all agreed. This is a great land. This is going to be a wonderful place to live. But the majority said, we'll never be able to conquer the land. The people are far too powerful. A minority of the spies said, look, we've seen the promise of God faithfully kept. We have witnessed his power. With God and his promises, we can go in and take it because it will be God's power that does it. But the majority ruled. And the majority of the people ruled. And lacking faith, they didn't go in. In fact, they were so perturbed with Moses and where their plot in life was that they were contemplating and seriously taking steps to kill him and get some new leadership. God confronts them, reveals his glory, says, you know, there have been ten times already that you have rebelled against me. He said about the adult leaders, all the adults, none of you will actually enter the promised land. They're going to spend now the next 40 years in that wilderness waiting for that generation to die. And their descendants would finally enter the promised land. The words of our text occur just a short time after that. The setting is that we are told that a man named Korah, he was belonged to the tribe of Levi. The Levites were responsible for taking care of and doing the work in and around the worship area. See, an important work that he was called upon by God to do as a member of that tribe, but he wasn't a descendant of Aaron, and he wasn't belong to that family which was given the responsibility of being a priest. We're told that Korah, and also Dathan, and Abiram, and An, they were all members of a different tribe called Reuben. And with them were 250 Israelite men, well-known community leaders, who had been appointed members of the council. They came as a group to oppose Moses and Aaron. They came as a group, so there's been some planning, there's been some organizing, there's a whole lot of talk, there's been a whole lot of grumbling that's been going on. And they are coming as a group opposed to Moses and Aaron. Korah wanted to have the right and the privilege of being a priest like Aaron was doing. And those other three, along with their other followers, they wanted to be uh, having a bigger say in the leadership and getting rid of Moses. They wanted a new leadership team because that was their problem, so they thought. And they came with such pious thinking. They said to Moses and Aaron, you've gone too far. The whole community is holy, every one of them. And the Lord is with them. They were right. The whole nation of Israel had been set apart as belonging to the Lord. They were all holy through the Messiah. And the Lord was with every single one of them. Moses and Aaron weren't at all saying that God was only with them. But it's the next sentence. As they continued... Why then do you set yourselves above the Lord's assembly? You have appointed yourself to these roles that you are carrying out. They didn't see the hand of God. Moses understood immediately. This wasn't a personal attack. This was a rebellion against God. God, we don't like the way you're leading things here with Moses. We're going to change that. God, we don't like the format that you've given for Old Testament leading of worship. We're going to change that. 
See how they were taking their little puny fist and shaking it in God's face and saying, who's in control here? We don't like the way you're doing it. We're going to do it our way. You know, why does God record events like this? He didn't just record it to make his book longer. He recorded it. Paul says in the New Testament, it's a warning for us. He said in our epistle reading this morning, these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us. Because you see, Satan can come to us and lead us to shake our little puny fists at God and inquire, who's in control? Specifically, he said, do not be idolaters, as some of them were. The people sat down to eat and drink, idolaters, because they thought the things of life and the fun of life are what really matter. It was a warning. Because we want to live life our way. He said, we should not commit sexual immorality. Whether that's heterosexual immorality or homosexual immorality. To think, I, I don't like the way God plans this. I'm going to do it my way. Is shaking our little fists at God. And demanding who's in control. He said, we should not test the Lord as some of them did. He said, and do not grumble as some of them did. Complaining about your lot in life and what God has allowed to answer. And it's probably at that point something that you would not have all desired, not something you planned for, not something that in your wildest and worst imaginations you thought was going to happen, but it happened. And don't grumble to God because what are you doing? Shaking your little puny fist at God. Who's in control? I don't like the way you're doing this. See the rebellion against the glory of God that's evident in these people see how it can be, become part of our own attitude as they've come and come with their opposition and insolent rebellion against the Lord but confronting Moses and Aaron Moses said to Korah and his 250 other followers who who had censers, that's a metallic instrument in which, in, in which incense was burned, and it was part of Old Testament worship, reserved for the priesthood. He said, tomorrow, come with your censers. Aaron will be here with his. We'll gather before the, the Lord's tent, and we'll let the Lord decide whom he has chosen. And then he summoned Dathan and Abiram, the other followers of him. They refused to come. Their insolent rebellion, we aren't even going to bother to acknowledge your authority to summon us. He let the word be known, tomorrow we'll have all of this squared away with the Lord. The next morning came and you know, even at a distance of 3,500 years, it takes our breath away. Moses goes to the community and says, move away from the dwellings, from the tents of Dathan, Abiram, Korah. Especially Dathan and Abiram are standing there Confident before their tents, their families with them, supporting them. They had the numbers. All Moses had was Moses and Aaron. God tells them to move away. And after they have moved away and Moses has stopped speaking, the earth opens up, swallows their possessions, all of their families. 
they go alive into the grave and the earth closes up again. Difficult to even comprehend, isn't it? To, to process that? We have a temptation maybe to think, uh, really, did God do that? <laughs> he, he would be that judgmental about sin? We maybe have a temptation to, as we try to process it to think, well, you know, maybe they just walked off a cliff and it was really a deep cliff and nobody could get down there to save them and, and that's all that happened. That's not at all what it says. And the 250 that were in front of the tent of meeting with their censers thinking that they could rearrange what God had directed for Old Testament worship, God burned them. They were gone. He gave the command to Eliezer, one of the sons of Aaron, take the censers, hammer them out, put them on the burnt offering altar as a constant reminder only God's designated people have this privilege in Old Testament times. The judgment of God over sin is real. Sometimes that judgment happens in this world. The judgment of God awaits finally at the end of time for all. And that's where we need to hear the words of Jesus when he simply calls people to repent or to perish. We certainly see the glory of God's holiness and his judgment carried out. But we also see the reality of God's grace and glory revealed as well. You know, in, in the verses interspersed throughout this chapter of Numbers, there's a, a point a little before our text where it becomes apparent that kind of all the Israelites are kind of leaning with those in rebellion. Thought maybe they had a point. And God's ready to wipe out the entire nation. And Moses pleads for mercy. And God gives it spares them and gives them another chance in repentance to have renewed faith. Sons of Korah, we are told a little bit later in the book of Numbers, they didn't stand with their father. They didn't agree with their father. They separated themselves from their father because they knew that was rebellion against God. You know, when you get to the book of Psalms, written several hundred years later, in the Bible, there are 11 Psalms written by the sons of Korah. Grace. To spare the repentant. And yes, to even utilize them in the future. During this Lenten season, it's a season when we especially realize the tremendous significance of sin and the price that had to be paid for it. Jesus, the very Son of God, suffering the punishment we deserve by his death on a cross, his blood shed to wash away all of our guilt. All of the times included when we might have clenched our little puny fist at God and said, who's in control here? I don't like the way you're doing this. I've got a better plan for life and what I want to do. And he invites us to repent, realize in Jesus we have forgiveness and an ongoing relationship with that Savior God. The glory of God's grace revealed also. We have an incident, not a well-known incident, in the Old Testament here that certainly reminds us of the holiness and the judgment of God. 
that sin is no trifling matter. It is tremendously significant before a holy God. But we also see a God of grace who communicates and accomplished a complete forgiveness by what Jesus has done for us. Repent as you realize the details of sin in your own life. Look to that Savior forgiveness. And in that Savior, live a new life. That a God of grace is in control. And you rejoice to be under his control always. Amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.